Chad, um, it's interesting that you know you hear people like Jamie Dimon saying they've played the climate change issue exactly wrong. That that now you need you needed to have energy production in America to counter um, the effort by some of these smaller countries and even Germany to go back to coal. Uh, so they're they're not winning on climate change. It's dirtier because of the effort to not produce in America. And it's, it seems like that message is starting to seep through, even up on Capitol Hill. And that message doesn't work for the Democrats anywhere outside of urban areas or even swing states. I mean, you know, it wasn't that long ago that you had Democratic senators in North and South Dakota. You know, you have one Democratic senator in West Virginia, Joe Manchin. We'll see if he's still here in a couple of years. That used to be a Democratic state. Uh, Democrats find themselves in these more rural states, unable to win at all, because some of the policies ranging from climate change to other, you know, social policy issues just don't resonate. And the problem that Democrats are going to face going forward, not just after this election, but in the future, is can they ever get any of those senators back? If they lose control of the Senate this time around, 2024 is a very, very bad map. Uh, for the Democrats in terms of the senators who are up. And it might be, you know, we talked about 40 years that the Democrats had control of the House from from the mid-1950s until the mid-1990s. It could be maybe not that long, but a very long period of time because of the point I just made that the Democrats never get the House back, get the Senate back. But here's the other underlying problem. You know, we talked about... Let me interrupt you. Let me interrupt interrupt you. If they had changed the filibuster rules and if you (laughs) actually had what you're saying happen, they would be internally in the minority. <laughs> yes, exactly. And all the things that they would pass would be undone here uh, in next year if Republicans win the Senate. And of course, that is still a big if. Uh, something I, I want to point out, you know, they thought that this abortion issue would really resonate with Democratic voters, pro-choice voters. It did. Uh, they may have peaked too early. But look at the state of Nevada, you know, where you have Catherine Cortez Masto on the ballot here. You know, there's a lot of questions about Hispanic voters in that state and whether or not that issue resonates in a place like Nevada. Control of the Senate could come down to Nevada. The other factor at work there is that Harry Reid is not around anymore. Uh, Senator Reid died, the former late Senate Majority Leader. You know, she came, Catherine Cortez Masto, from the Harry Reid machine, and that's not how it works right now in Nevada. One last point on this. We see a trend maybe a little bit toward Republicans. Uh, We don't see this wave, as Leslie suggested. I talked to one, you know, pretty, you know, down the middle, uh, you know, uh, consultant today, somebody who does lean to the left, but is pretty straightforward, who said he thinks that all this is going to be much closer than people anticipate But don't forget that events on the world stage sometimes impact these elections. And don't forget that 60 falls ago, we had the missiles of October, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, you know, there were some Republicans at the time, Barry Goldwater among them, who thought that John F. Kennedy, you know, cooked this up to try to help them in the midterms. It turns out the Democrats only lost uh, five seats in the House of Representatives, actually gained four seats in the Senate, which was a long t- first time that that particular class of senators had gained seats uh, since the 1930s. And look what we're talking about right now on the foreign policy stage. Missiles of October, the saber rattling, you know, the president's comment the other day about Armageddon and Vladimir Putin. Don't underestimate Putin's ability to try to weasel his way into the psyche of the American voter just ahead of a midterm election. Yeah, I would argue, though, Byron, that that uncertainty uh, spooks not only the markets, but, but people at home. And if they don't feel great about their security, it usually goes against the administration in power, I, I think. But listen, historically, midterms do that. Historically, the White House, the party in power in the White House loses seats. I mean, that's that's just history. The other thing we've been watching lately is elections where Republicans are under polling by two to four points across the board. Byron. This is a really uh, fascinating subject, this this idea of polling bias or polling error. First of all, we should say we should all hope that Chad is wrong about a nuclear crisis uh, yes, in, exactly. in October or any other time. Let's, let's not have one. Um, but on, on this polling thing, uh, Real Clear Politics has just started doing something uh, interesting. They, they look at their, their averages 
in the key Senate races. And then they look at what polling showed in, in that particular state in 2016, Trump versus Clinton, 2018, whatever midterm they had then, and 2020, Trump versus Biden. And in most states, the polls seriously underestimated Republican performance. For example, uh, in Georgia, um, the, uh, the polls today show Raphael Warnock with a 3.7 percentage point lead over Herschel Walker. They go back and look at those polls, 16, 18, and 20, and found that they actually uh, underestimated Republican performance by 5.9%. Well, what if that happens again this time? That means Herschel Walker is actually a couple of points ahead. Uh, this is speculative at the moment, but we do have a record of, of polling mistakes, especially at the state level, uh, for quite a while now, and it could mm -hmm. make a difference in how we look at some of these key races.